I'm pleased to introduce you to our two last presenters. We have Ray Lodato, who's a lecturer in the Environmental and Urban Studies and Public Policy Studies programs in the University of Chicago. And Dr. Lodato teaches courses on environmental policy, law, and politics, as well as urban sustainability. Possessing an extensive background in survey research, Dr. Lodato has conducted research projects for the NAACP, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, after uh, Dr. Lodato's presentation, we will, um, we are very fortunate to be hearing from Amir Gina, who is an assistant professor at Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. An environmental and development economist, his research focuses on the role of the environment and environmental change in the shaping of how societies develop. He uses applied excuse me, economic techniques combined with methods from climate science and remote sensing to understand the impacts of climate in both rich and poor countries. And he's conducted field work related to climate change ad adaptation with communities in India, Bangladesh, Kenya, and Uganda. So without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce you, Ray Lodato. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Abby. I appreciate it. Um, I have to admit that I came to this um, presentation not just as a scholar, but as a parent. And so I admire, of course, the work that you do. And also have dealt with this issue as a parent. Um, how do we speak to our children about climate change? I mean, how do we present it in a way that it uh, makes sense to them, that um, we don't totally scare them? and they don't end up with despair. I mean, it's been a constant challenge for me to be studying these issues and to also parent my own children through this, um, this period of time. And so that's kind of where I'm coming from with this presentation is what, are, what is it that we can do in terms of presenting the uh, climate change world to our children, um, especially at a younger age. It's a little bit more, it's a little bit different with uh, the students we have here you know, if they have a complaint about it, we could, you know, you're of age, go fix it. But um, with younger children, I'm, I'm, I can see the challenge that, uh, that you face every day. So let's, let, that's kind of what I started to deal with here. Um, first things first, with your students who will soon become our students, perhaps we shouldn't talk about climate change. Perhaps we shouldn't talk about change at all. Because this is the climate they're growing up with. They don't know any differently. The disastrous effects of superstorms, the extended hurricane seasons, sea level rise, droughts, longer wildfire seasons are all characteristics of the only world they've ever known. So there's really no point of comparison for them. They don't know mild winters. They don't know gentle rainstorms. They don't know wildfires that can be fairly easily controlled. Um, they have to cope with this even at the youngest ages, especially at the youngest ages, and they don't know differently. It's like when I teach my US environmental policy course, uh, we discuss the fact that there were 13 major environmental laws passed in the US in the decade of the 1970s, okay? I say this was a period of bipartisan consensus on environmental issues. The Clean Air Act of 1970 passed 89 to nothing in the US Senate, so no dissenting votes at all. And my students look at me as if I just, you know, told them, uh, you know, something like, and there was no internet, and the phone was on the wall. So, you know, it's a complete lack of comprehension about, you know, the idea of bipartisanship on environmental issues producing the kind of results that we want. But we also need to be sensitive to the students at the ages you have them. Okay, we can't just say it was better before, and, and I know you know that. We can't expect to tell them, sorry, adults have screwed it up, it's gonna get worse, but recess is in 10 minutes, so it's, everything's gonna be great. So. While we have to acknowledge the challenges of the new climate we've created, it's critically important that we give them hope for the better future, one they can build together. And fortunately, we do have some examples that shed some important light on how to make things better environmentally, real life examples that provide some promise of hope. As many of you know, in the 1980s, um, a discovery was made that atmospheric ozone of the Antarctic was rapidly decreasing. In fact, a hole was appearing that was letting in unfiltered ultraviolet light, causing the melting of the polar ice caps 
and raising the, the potential for increased cases of skin cancer. There was international alarm, but there was also a commitment to action on the part of the nations of the world. But to make a long story short, in a very abbreviated period of time from that discovery to the final action, despite opposition from manufacturers of chlorofluorocarbons, the nations of the world entered into an agreement to ban CFCs through something called the Montreal Protocol in 1987. Now remember, the Cold War was still going on at that time. The nations of the world were still aligned with either the US or the Soviet Union at the precipice of nuclear war. So even though there seems to be some nostalgia for saying, oh, it was easier then, it was better then, it wasn't as complicated then, we were really at a time that it wasn't that a simpler time necessarily. It wasn't in which, one in which the agreement was reached easily necessarily. Some of the features of the uh, Montreal Protocol that led to its success are also important to uh, relate to your students. First, the nations of the world agreed on the scientific findings, okay, which were somewhat preliminary at the time, and created a flexible instrument in the Montreal Protocol that allowed for tighter or looser controls if the findings changed in one direction or another. This was known as the precautionary principle, the idea that action should be taken to address environmental problems before absolute scientific certainty was obtained. In contrast to environmental law, where courts can dismiss a case because the issue is not ripe, the precautionary principle acknowledges that environmental damage can be irreversible, and waiting for damage to occur before addressing it may be too late. Okay. This led to a second critical feature of the protocol, namely that nations were not tied to one set of solutions. Because the approach taken by the nations of the world acknowledged that greater scientific certainty could lead to a better or worse diagnosis of the problem, there was flexibility built into the agreement as to what solutions would be tried. When new findings uncovered the fact that the problem was worse than originally assumed, the prescriptions, including a total ban on CFCs, were made stronger. The agreement, like the climate accords that followed it, also accounted for differentiated responsibilities, whereas less developed nations were using fewer CFCs but also did not have the capacity to switch to alternative substances with ease, were given additional time to transition away from CFCs. In addition, the wealthier nations created a fund to help them do so. All of these provisions would be applicable to any global climate change accord. In fact, as, other stu as climate studies have advanced, the reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, have become more certain of the fact of climate change and humanity's role in causing it. The agreements entered into by the world community have also become more strict, from the Rio Agreement in 1992, to Kyoto in 1997, to Paris in 2015. But the moral of the story, of course, is that the ozone hole is closing. It's improving on a regular basis. Okay, the Montreal Protocol worked. An international agreement intended to reverse a negative environmental effect, and one which was achieved with the banning of a polluting substance, worked. It reversed the growth of the ozone hole and has led to a substantial repair of the problem. I'll show you a short video that talks about that. This is from NASA. This year, the ozone hole over Antarctica was far smaller than expected. In fact, it was the smallest since the ozone hole was discovered, the result of unusual weather patterns in the stratosphere over the South Pole. The ozone hole is caused by interactions between chlorine from chemicals called chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, and ozone. Although CFCs were banned by the Montreal Protocol in 1987, they last a long time in the atmosphere. Ozone depletion is enhanced when temperatures are colder, so the ozone hole fluctuates with the season, appearing during the colder austral winter months and disappearing by summer. It reaches an annual maximum size in early southern spring, usually in October. This year, the polar vortex, a spiraling wind pattern over the South Pole, was unusually wonky. This warmed the stratosphere, the part of the atmosphere with the ozone layer, which significantly slowed down ozone depletion. Although the small ozone hole this year was caused by weather patterns, the ozone layer has shown overall signs of improvement as a result of the Montreal Protocol. NASA and NOAA have worked together to study the ozone hole since its discovery. Okay, I don't know if you've ever seen this one before. This is one of my favorites. Has anyone seen how wolves change rivers? Yes. So, oh, you have. Okay. Well, let's just watch it briefly. I
One of the most exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. And the classic example is what happened in the Yellowstone National Park in the United States when wolves were reintroduced in 1995. Now, we, we all know that wolves kill various species of animals, but perhaps we're slightly less aware that they give life to many others. Before the wolves turned up, they'd been absent for 70 years. That the numbers of deer, because there was nothing to hunt them, had built up and built up in the Yellowstone Park. And despite efforts by humans to control them, they'd managed to reduce much of the vegetation there to almost nothing. They'd just grazed it away. But as soon as the wolves arrived, even though they were few in number, they started to have the most remarkable effects. First, of course, they killed some of the deer, but that wasn't the major thing. Much more significantly, they radically changed the behavior of the deer. The deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily, particularly the valleys and the gorges. And immediately, those places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. Bare valley sides quickly became forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. And as soon as that happened, the birds started moving in. The number of songbirds and migratory birds started to increase greatly. The number of beavers started to increase because beavers like to, to eat the trees. And beavers, like wolves, are ecosystem engineers. They create niches for other species. And the dams they built in the rivers um, provided habitats for otters and muskrats and ducks and fish and reptiles and amphibians. The wolves killed coyotes and as a result of that, the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, which meant more hawks, more weasels, more foxes, more badgers. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carrion that the wolves had left. Bears fed on it too, and their population began to rise as well, partly also because there were more berries growing on the regenerating shrubs. And the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the calves of the deer. Here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. They began to meander less. There was less erosion. The channels narrowed. More pools formed. More riffle sections, all of which were great for wildlife habitats. The rivers changed in response to the wolves. And the reason was that the regenerating forests stabilized the banks so that they collapsed less often, so that the rivers became more fixed in their course. Similarly, by driving the deer out of some places and the vegetation recovering on the valley sides, there was a soil erosion because the vegetation stabilized that as well. So the wolves, small in number, transformed not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, but also its physical geography. So I really like these two videos because a lot of times when we talk about environmental problems, we talk about environmental policies, we don't see the end result. And I think this is a really important way to prove the importance of good environmental policy, is to show that there is an actual result that uh, is positive for in, uh, the environment and humanity uh, at the end, as it, the end result. In my international environmental policy course, we spend considerable time looking at the effects of nations the efforts of nations throughout the world to address the climate crisis. Too often, analyses of the, of the climate crisis look at the success or failure of these agreements that are reached at the Conference of Parties meetings held every December at various locations. While each of the agreements I mentioned before is important to understanding how climate change is being addressed, 
we know those agreements are not necessarily being enforced by the nations of the world and that it's difficult to police them. But at a more local level, countries have undertaken policies on their own that attempt to address the climate crisis as well. I invite representatives from various consulates in Chicago to speak to my class about their country's plans and practices on environmental issues. And to date, we've welcomed visitors from the Republic of South Africa, Costa Rica, Germany, and Japan to give us an idea of what's going on in their countries. While some of the discussion is more appropriate for a higher level, um, the idea that there are initiatives that are ongoing around the world gives hope and inspires people to do more. Finally, getting back to ozone depletion, I would recommend a program called Ozone Whole, How We Save the Planet. It's a PBS documentary from earlier this year. Uh, it gives a good timeline of the issue, explains it in detail, doesn't spare the issue of the pushback that the leading scientists receive from industry when they identified CF CFCs as the culprit of ozone deple depletion. And also putting on my political scientist hat now, one of the key pass messages in that documentary is that it matters who we elect. Before anyone gets skittish that I'm going to get partisan here, let me point out the documentary makes the point that Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, who were leaders of the U.S. and Great Britain at the time, were instrumental in the success of the Montreal Protocol. Reagan was a skin cancer survivor and understood that the ozone layer's role in limiting the sun's UV rays. Thatcher was a chemist by training, took a leading role in moving toward a solution. So the other message for students is that they have to insist that the candidates they vote for, regardless of party, understand the importance of the issue and support those who pledge to do something about it. So thank you. We're going to walk around, so hopefully this will, will work and you can hear me. Can people hear me? OK. Um, something that Abby didn't mention because I didn't write it in, or it's not in that standard bio that gets sent around the university, is that before I started my PhD, I was a high school teacher. And I'll let you, dis you can infer from the fact that I'm no longer a high school teacher how successful or not I was at that. And you'll also see some evidence of what school were you at? my boring style. I was, it was actually in Japan. And I'm from Ireland, so I was definitely not a US high school teacher. OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my own research and the research of the kind of things that I do. Coming on the, the, um, the point of this event, what we try to do in a lot of the research that I'm doing is to localize the effects of climate change, not only the temperature and environmental changes we see, but also the consequences of that, to try and think about the, the policies and the responses that happen at local levels. One of the things that I found is helpful about doing this is that it's a great communications tool, whether it's with policymakers or whether it's with uh, high school students or other things. I have a, a nephew who's 14 years old, and we just concluded a partnership with Nike, with the lab that I work with, where we have provided them some of their sports ambassadors, um, like Roger Federer, et cetera, uh, information about climate change. And they've discussed their experience with heat and changing climate. And I sent it to my nephew. And for once, he got interested in the work that I do for a living. So in trying to localize those things, find the right ambassadors, the right stories, uh, we found that to be a useful communications tool. So this is kind of the 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 main problem, this is climate change, is the way that I would view it a lot of the time. You might have seen something like this already today. Um, and this is the thing which I'm going to say is not particularly helpful for communicating what's going on, but forms the basis. So this is historical uh, atmospheric concentrations, uh, sorry, historical uh, tons of CO2 emitted in blue. And each of these trajectories represents a potential future. And there's a lot of uncertainty about what these are going to be. They have some kind of esoteric names, RCP 8.5 for this red one that goes up at the top, RCP 4.5 for this yellow one. But essentially, these are about the choices that we make as society. So I think this is at the, the crux of the issue is what happens in the future, because we're ultimately talking about something that lasts for hundreds of years when we release CO2, uh, depends on the choices we're making today, just like Ray was saying. This is what that means for the United States. Again, a little bit abstract. This is change in temperatures. As I mentioned, I'm Irish, so I'm thinking in Celsius, but there's a a helpful Fahrenheit scale there for you. Um, the US could see changes on the order of 10 degrees Fahrenheit under that high emissions trajectory. So these are some big changes, but still a little bit abstract in what does that mean. 
So I want to give you a little bit of a sense of how I think about or how um, people on the, the socioeconomic side of climate and others as well are thinking about those impacts before we even start thinking about policies. So first of all, as was pointed out in the previous talk I, I heard caught the end of, the food, the food supply is one of the things which we know is going to be most affected by climate change. This is something which is, of course, very visceral and something which is in front of us every day. And so we've got to start thinking about the people who are producing that, their livelihoods, the food that ends up coming to us. Within that, when people experience impacts, they're also adapting. So people have adapted to some very adverse conditions. And I find uh, discussing those stories to be something which is pretty compelling. So this was a, a farmer in, in Bangladesh where I was doing some field work. This area of land, it's a massive area of land in the north of Bangladesh, which floods seasonally. And so it's underwater for six months of the year. And they have switched to plant crops when it's dry and to fish when it's wet. And so people have adapted to some pretty uh, adverse conditions. One of the other things I spend time thinking about, one which is very uh, compelling and has been pointed out already by a few people, is the, the increase in intensity of storms. This was uh, San Juan just about two weeks after, after Hurricane Maria. Behind all of this is what's driving the changes in, in emissions. And essentially that's our energy use. This is a picture from Delhi, actually where I was last week. Um, in some horrific air pollution, yeah. showing the, the air coolers which are, are being used there to cool people down in temperatures which get as high as 110 degrees Fahrenheit or so in the summer. So extremely hot temperatures. Air conditioning is one of the best adaptations that people have. And yet, very few parts of the world, probably only 20, 30 percent of the people in the world, are wealthy enough to afford that adaptation. So they're living sweltering in these conditions. This is from a project in, in a different side of Delhi, a person who lives in a slum, she has no access to air conditioning. What is she going to do as she's um, thinking about adapting to these 110 degree Fahrenheit temperatures she's experiencing all summer long? And then of course the, the final piece of this is, again, which was mentioned is, the biggest part of the challenge is our choices, our energy use, as was pointed out, making sure that we bring in people who are committed to thinking this is a problem, a waste management problem on a vast scale, and one which in the past was a completely bipartisan issue about the quality of the world that we live in, and move to something like renewable temperatures. That's a picture from, from Norway where they have renewable temperatures, but still re renewable energy, but still produce a, a huge amount of oil. Um, so I wanted to discuss how some of those impacts manifest um, in ways which are often kind of surprising, and this is where I get into the kind of data and research that I do. So first of all, on the, the causes, and one thing I found very compelling to talk about this, as was pointed out by Ray as well, this idea of common but differentiated responsibilities. There are a set of countries who have been responsible for climate change, and a set of countries who have suffered the effects of those, but also in the future will be contributing. How do we balance what's happening here in the US in an advanced economy which needs to reduce its emissions and has gained from those emissions in the past with somewhere like India or somewhere like China which will gain from those emissions and improve the lives of millions of people um, but in the process are also gonna harm the environment. Um, it's a pretty tricky discussion to have because it often turns into who has the right to pollute, who doesn't, who has the right to a high standard of living and who doesn't and that's why this is a particularly difficult issue. These are, this is a map of the top emitters of CO2, the main cause of climate change. Um, and you see China, the United States, and India are the top three at the moment. If you group the EU together, it's actually number three. So it looks like here's our climate change culprits. If, however, you view this in terms of the tons emitted per person, the map changes dramatically. And you see that you have Russia and the United States and Australia and a lot of the Middle East. China is actually quite high, but countries like India are producing almost no CO2 per person, just around two tons per person, whereas the US is producing about 16 or something like that. So there's a lot of space for India to grow. It's also got a billion and we'll have a billion and a half people by the middle of the century. And so this is a, a, something which the fate of the atmosphere essentially rests in their hands, and yet the benefits to them are incredibly um, real of raising their incomes. Russia is one of the highest emitters, yeah, per capita. And Eastern Europe or no Eastern Europe? Eastern Europe is kind of in the middle, and then you have um, 
some countries in the Middle East and the Caribbean are very high emitters, but they're also very small populations. This is essentially perfectly correlated with the amount of income that a country has, how rich it is. And so there's a very tight relationship between energy use and the amount of money that we have. One of the first things we think of, you can ignore what these maps say, this is just to remind me of what to say. One of the first things we think of, as I said, is food security. There's definitely evidence of climate, changes in climate affecting food security and food supply. And we often think this is really something that happens in poorer subsistence places. But of course, we're in a global society. Um, so what's the consequence of, of food security changes? This is some work that, that I've done showing that as temperatures get hotter, um, as a result of El Nino, of ENSO events, this is the, the weight for age of, of children under five. So essentially their level of nutrition. And as the temperatures get hotter, that drops by about half a standard deviation. Kids basically start to starve um, as a consequence of the food supply decreasing. So this is something that's happening mostly throughout the tropics. It also has an effect, that food security has an effect on human security. So there's a lot of research on showing that the temperatures increase can actually destabilize places. So it can lead to more conflicts, more civil conflicts. There's some evidence linking that to what we're seeing in Syria at the moment. And these are other issues, I think, which are angles to start talking about environmental degradation based on what's happening in the world. So that's in tropical countries and largely in poorer countries. Can we expect to see this in the US? The answer is yes. Surprisingly, we do. So let's just focus on one of these. This is basically what I spend all my time doing is producing these figures. They're showing the relationship between temperature and some outcome. So if we look at this mortality one at the top, this is kind of a classic example. This is the number of deaths or the death rate, and this is the average daily temperature. And what this line means is that for very cold days, colder than this average, there's an increased number of deaths. For very hot days, there's an increased number of deaths. There's this U shape. A lot of things within the social system don't respond in ways that are kind of no, uh, in, in expected ways to, to changes in temperature. So we could be in a situation where if you're in a very cold place and the climate changes, you will see benefits. Norway and Russia and other countries. But if you're in hot places, you'll start to see harms. There's other things as well, whether we'll notice this in the US or not. This is the effect it has on people's incomes. So this is temperatures getting hotter and people's incomes are basically stable. And above a certain temperature, people start to make less money. So if they have more hot days in a year in the United States, and this is from real data, people are making less money. And this is one which I think probably would resonate pretty well with uh, some of the people you're talking to. If you look at people on Twitter and look at how they talk on hot days versus cold days, they tend to use a lot more profanity on hotter and colder days. And you see that across all things. So people's moods are really affected by hot days and cold days and their anger on Twitter. So let's think a little bit about how we take this into the future. So this is what we had before the temperature changes. Again, just in thinking of localizing this, so I don't know if you're all from, from Illinois or various states, trying to come up with compelling ways to localize what's happening with climate change is, it's now a whole field. And online, there's hundreds of thousands of visualizations. Um, this is my addition to that crowded field, but I think it's very important to try and think of ways that makes this a more compelling issue. This is summer temperatures from average from 1981 to, to 2010, so kind of current summer temperatures. And this is where the various states in the US sit in terms of those temperatures. Illinois is here at around 75 degrees as an average summer temperature. On this side is what will happen by the end of this century, which is only 80 years from now. I mean, 2080, only 60 years from now. Um, so you can see that Illinois by then will have become hotter than Texas is currently by far. And these are current temperatures in some different countries. Illinois will be as hot as the summer temperatures in India. And you can see what happens to Texas. Texas in that future becomes hotter than Saudi Arabia is currently. So thinking of ways to try and make these changes compelling in a way that we can understand based on current experience is something which a lot of people are trying to do. And there's a lot of resources and things like that for this online. Um, some of which, it's, it's seeing some figures like this which, which shocked me into working on climate change. 
um, the Keeling curve, if you know that. So we had these U-shaped responses. What does that mean for the United States? So this was mortality, this was electricity demand. And this is what happens by 2100 in the United States. Red here means more deaths. Blue means fewer deaths. So just like I was saying, in places that are already cold, that were kind of at these cold temperatures and they get a little bit warmer, they're going to see benefits from that. Places that are already hotter, they're going to see damages. So here's cases where there's winners and losers because of climate change. This is really reflected globally as well. There are certain cases with violent crime, so I mentioned that there was this uh, relationship between conflict, international conflict, civil wars, and climate, and people often think, oh yeah, that's just a poor country thing. That's just in places where they have bad institutions, etc. And of course, the US is kept together, it's kept out of civil war by a very strong institutions um, that hopefully will remain so. But the crimes you see, interpersonal violence, actually increase pretty strongly, and this is not just more crimes in the summer versus the winter, this is the causal effect, so this is the effect of a particularly hot day within a location compared to a particularly cold day at the same time of year. So not only are there more crimes in the summer, but within the summer on a hotter day, it's leading to more crimes as people interact with each other more, but it also seems to affect our psychology. That's why we see more profanity on Twitter. Um, so the US is definitely not immune to some of these effects. We do these for all of the different responses that I show, different outcomes. And this is from a paper we published a couple of years ago. High risk labor, yes, sorry, I didn't explain this. So this is labor productivity. Low risk labor is things where you work indoors. High risk is farming, etc. So you're seeing the same kind of food effects, the effects on farmers uh, in the United States. You can skip that one. When you add those all up, you apply some values to them. This is what the projection looks like for the United States at the end of the century. Green parts are places, so this is in terms of the percent of the incomes in each county in the United States. Green places are having benefits. Red places or orange places are having damages. What the previous figure kind of said is, and you can take my word for this one, but the overall, and for the national economy in the United States, this is, looks like a damage of about 4% of GDP per year, 4% of the US economy per year by the end of the century, if we don't do anything about this. So they're big costs. But the important thing to note here is if we take all of these counties and we, we put them by, uh, we, we, we uh, plot whatever their income is, and we look at what the damages are, as a function of their income. So we group together the poorest 10% of counties up right up to the richest 10% of counties. This is one big point which I think we found to be extremely compelling in trying to explain this to people and it's the broad issue of environmental justice. Poorer counties are experiencing larger damages from projected damages from climate change than richer countries are. This is something which exacerbates current inequalities in society and we see that not just in the US, we were surprised to see it in the US, but you see that all over the world. And I think that's a pretty compelling way to try and uh, everybody understands what fairness and justice are like. And that's a, a, a good language to start to discuss some of these issues with because this will exacerbate current issues of unfairness or bad distribution of income. So some solutions, we can skip that. Two broad things that we need to do for climate change. One is mitigation, we need to stop the CO2 emissions. Um, which is the cause of climate change. But in a lot of parts of the world, and even in the US, we also need to adapt. So as we see these increasingly intense hurricanes coming into places like Houston or along the Atlantic seaboard, we need to invest in adaptation. We no longer can avoid some of the impacts that we're seeing. So dealing with the reality of what it means to live in a world with, maybe not talking about climate change, but just this new reality that people are living in, requires some adaptation. Um, on the mitigation side, the US was doing great. From 2005, emissions were declining. They were almost at 17% below, which was the goal set uh, under the Paris Accord. But there was a jump up in the last year because of uh, current administration policies. And even though the market will continue to keep that low, it's definitely not gonna get down to what the goal stated was in the Paris Accord, which of course the US is officially pulling out of now. Um, One of the other things is, as I've already said, in rich countries, it's very easy to adapt. And I say very easy, it's maybe not very easy, but it's more possible to adapt. This is a picture of Japan. 
air conditioners, etc. When you walk past any department store in Japan, if you've ever been in the summer, the doors are usually open and there are gales of ice cold wind coming out. They're able to do that and they're consuming a lot of energy to do so. When you're in India, you definitely can't afford that. You don't even have reliable electri electricity. And this is a place which is comparatively wealthy compared to other parts of the world. You see this dichotomy very strongly even within the United States. You have uh, about 40% of the population in the United States can't afford a $400 emergency expenditure in a year. People are spending huge proportions of their income on their energy bills. And so when we see uh, hot summer temperatures, people are shutting down their air conditioners and suffering these health costs and other costs that, we are, that we're trying to identify. And kind of one of the things that we really need to do and one thing that I found compelling is in thinking about this is the woman who was in that slum on the south of Delhi. How do we expand those types of, how do we think about her story where she's going home every day to 110 degrees Fahrenheit inside her house? She has a young child. They take water from a municipal tanker because they don't have a good water supply. So they have three buckets of water in the day. And one of the only ways they can cool is to throw their only drinking water onto the floor and let it evaporate. How can we extend some of these benefits of adaptation to people who can't afford this? And so part of what we're doing is trying to find low cost solutions. Um, so in this case, cool roofs that would allow for passive cooling. But I think in, to abstract from this a bit, trying to think about the stories of the people impacted by climate change and potentially what they could do in response has become one of the, eas not easier, but one of the more compelling ways to try and communicate this to people of all ages and in all walks of life. Um, I think that's all that I wanted to say. This, what we've tried to do, and I think one of the things which has been helpful both in the research but also in the communication of what climate change is, is to move for some abstract picture like this tons of carbon emissions or concentrations of CO2 to something like this, so maybe not using this figure, but the story behind it, which is, this is something which affects this structure and the idea of, that we have of society. This is affecting the, our social fabric, our ideas of fairness about what we want to be like as a society. And I think those are some aspects where we can start talking about this that make it a little bit more compelling and resonate with people. And I think that's all I have. Thank you. Have you thought of studying human migration patterns because of climate change? And uh, have you studied it or have you thought of studying it? Because currently, Sub Saharan Africa, I mean, they are starving and a lot of people are migrating just for food and economic reasons. Yeah. So, the, I, I, at the end of yesterday, I just had my regular weekly meeting about a project looking at human migration and, and climate change. Um, so the answer is yes. There's evidence showing that, um, that asylum applications in Europe, when places experience more kind of droughts or hotter temperatures, that you see this increase in asylum applications, even though that's not the reason why they're applying for asylum. These are people living in pretty bad conditions already, reasons to flee, and what the climate does is it pushes them over the edge, and they say we need to leave. Uh, there's uh, evidence showing that the increase of people flowing into cities in Syria, which was like um, associated with the destabilization there. So it's a really difficult question to answer. One of the things that people often ask me is, is oh, well, all these results you've shown, people can just move away and everybody's gonna be fine because you can migrate. But if you look at the world now and think that there's migration without uh, a lot of uh, frictions or, or hardship in trying to move, then you're probably not watching the news properly. So I don't think it's a big solution, but I think it's a big issue as probably as a maybe a follow-up, like what's the, the legal implications of that? There's no legal definition of a climate refugee. There's, so what, what's? Well, I mean, I, I actually have another take on this, which is um, it, there was recently a projection in the US that by 2030, I think it was, 2040, that 70% um, of the population would live in 15 states. So in terms of our politics, that would mean 70% of the population is represented by 30 senators 30% of the population is represented by 70 senators. But I think that requires that we ignore climate change. 
I think there are going to be, not necessarily refugees, but certainly there's relocation that's going to go on in the U.S. because we're a prosperous country, we won't call yeah. people refugees. But there will be relocation that will reshape our politics, that will reshape how we think of our country, we will rethink what we think of as a coastal area. What's a coastal area once you know, our current coastal cities are, are um, you know, underwater? And, and they may very well be. I mean, we, there are a couple of um, film documentaries on Miami that I've shown in my resiliency class, which are not hopeful at all, <laughs> you know, for the future of Miami. And that's 300,000 people there. So I'm not really sure. Um, and there was a great um, piece in the um, LA Times, a long piece um, a couple of months ago, about relocation on the California coast and how controversial that has been, and that people are, are putting up. You know, um, resistance to it, but the water is now, you know, pretty much in people's front, what it had been people's front yards. So, obviously, it's a much bigger issue on the on the global scale. The idea of of of, of, of climate refugees is, is a much bigger deal, and it's not covered. It's not something that's covered in any international policy. The policies on refugees don't recognize climate refugees at, at the present time. But it's also going to be a problem in a prosperous country like ours. One other thing to just add to that, the, you're not seeing people move away from e extreme climates at the moment. In the US, you see people move towards them. People are more likely to build on the coasts, which are more yeah. subject to flooding. Yeah. Everyone's moving to Houston. Yeah. And people were living in kind of badly zoned places when Hurricane Harvey hit, one of the reasons why there was a lot of flooding. So actually, that, that's really adding to the price tag of disasters we experience and other things in this country. It was interesting that you mentioned that people are moving to the areas where you'll probably experience a greater uh, impact. My question is, in the upper Midwest, in Midwest and upper Midwest, the impact that one of your slides showed is around negative five to about five percent. I'm wondering if you've, if you looked into or studied the cor possible correlation between the engagement level of the electorate or the citizenry, maybe even their apathy, um, towards uh, the issue of climate change? Mm. So there's, a, there's a, a group working in Yale called the Climate Change Communications Project, and they have incredible, incredible data, incredible infographics on how people are thinking about climate. So if that's something that you, uh, you're interested in like, using for your classes, that's a, it's a really good resource. They did an analysis in some newspaper using our data, just looking at how the opinions changed. And they found that it was the places that looked like they got benefits, which were often more firmer believers, believers uh, in climate change or in the science. I don't like using the word believe because I don't think it's uh, an issue of belief. Um, and the places in who were more opposed to those facts were in places that were projected to be worse, worse affected. So this was really the kind of basically the north-south divide. Um, and they saw that quite strongly. So the Yale Climate Change Communications Project is, I think, an incredibly cool resource, but then they took and tried to find the answer to your question and found that it, it kind of went against what you would expect a rational person to do. Hi, I just had a quick question uh, about, you mentioned about Japan and the use of air conditioning and the, uh, the frigid air leaving the doors open as you walk past the boutiques. That sounds kind of like Manhattan or Chicago as yeah. well. In Japan, they do have a, a program called uh, Cool Biz. Yeah. Because I have family there, and they generally dress a little bit more casual. Uh, how do we explain to students about teaching them about how to change our attitude towards air conditioning when somehow we have this aversion to outside temperatures, where in the summer we wear coats and inside in yeah. the winter we feel like wearing shorts and anything that's outside it has to be the, the has to be the opposite inside and then I'm sorry I just had a quick remark about the video about the introdu uh, reintroduction of wolves um, it's really inspiring because at Loyola University they have the stormwater project and since they have reintroduced native plants uh, it has combated soil erosion and also uh, brought bees, birds, as well as foxes and rabbits and all these. So it's created a whole ecosystem on a college campus, which I think is pretty extraordinary. So uh, it's a great thing that you shared. So, but uh, I don't know if you had an answer for the first part of the question I had. So, 
uh, I was I was working in, in in Japan when they instituted cool biz, um, and suddenly everyone showed up on a certain day with short sleeve shirts, and we had to keep the air conditioner at a higher temperature. It's like twenty degrees Celsius, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Um, the the as as an as an immigrant to the states, the a few things uh, struck me about how people interact with the their indoor temperatures, and it almost seems like it's. A country where people believe they have the right to wear t-shirts indoors in the winter. That's not the country I grew up in. We were always wrapped in multiple <laughs> sweaters and other things. So I find that a really stark difference. And it's it's true, just air conditioning and the use of it, not only in this country, but I think any country that's gotten wealthy enough to use it, it's just changed people's relationship with the environment uh, entirely. So in terms of shifting those norms, I mean, talking about the cool biz story is kind of, uh, it's an interesting one, but, um, those norm shiftings, they came in the United States gradually through the 1950s onwards, I think without people really realizing. We, we all have a preference for cooler, cooler air. Shifting those norms is a, is a huge area of research, and no one really knows how to do it. Uh, the Japanese tried something, but cool biz was not, definitely not popular. No one wanted to wear a Hawaiian shirt to work instead of a suit. Um, it led to a lot of, of like awkward interactions with people, so it was a hard thing to do. And then thank you for uh, the, your compliment about the, uh, the wolf video. I think one of the things that doesn't get enough attention is, is how successful our environmental laws have been in the US. Um, Ann Carlson from UCLA Law was here last year, and she had done extensive work on the Clean Air Act and how and its impact, especially on Los Angeles, where she's not only teaching, but she's from there, and how different it was growing up there in the 70s versus how it is now. And we don't hear that story enough, um, that how successful our environmental laws have been. Have they solved every environmental problem? Of course not, but um, they really have changed um, outcomes in this country um, in a major way. So one of the things that has happened in Illinois has been the reintroduction of buffalo mm. to prairie areas west of the city, like Kane County or even farther out. Unfortunately, I have not been able to visit there, but what I've read is not only have those prairies uh, gotten richer, I guess you would say, with different plant species, as the buffalo have caused um, new plants to grow because birds drop seeds and the, the churning up of the soil by the buffalo have resulted in better grasses there, even though the buffalo also eat those grasses. So I was wondering if uh, you're talking about people migration, but also animal migration in terms of reintroduction, not only the wolves, buffalo, uh, but this has happened in like desert areas of the southwest, I think. Has, is this being studied more for, for a positive effect? Um, an interesting thing you might want to uh, address with your classes is uh, a, a proposal by Frank and Deborah Popper from the 1990s. I think they were at Rutgers at the time to create what they called Buffalo Commons in the middle of the country, arguing that there were towns that were basically depopulated, that had fewer people per thousand than they did when the, pr when the frontier was declared closed. Um, so they really basically empty and to create this, recreate this Buffalo Commons in, in the middle. And it got, you can imagine the pushback they got from people who were in the, in the towns who were convinced they were one factory or one Walmart away from economic prosperity returning. Um, so it didn't, it didn't go anywhere. But it was an intri intriguing idea that, you know, maybe the thing to do is not to constantly stress development, but, con but look at a way that we could um, bring back you know, sort of a more natural habitat and see how that plays itself out. I just, if, I, if I can monopolize for a moment, I just had a, a, a thought about the behavioral thing, maybe thinking, maybe activating an old part of my brain. But the, um, has anyone seen the movie Blackfish? Yes. So it's a movie about uh, an orca who, uh, who ended up killing a bunch of trainers in, in SeaWorld uh, in a pre what seemed to be a premeditated way. And in watching that documentary, I had a like, very stark shift of, of a norm that I hadn't realized before, which was, yes, previously I just had assumed it's okay to see these animals performing. But then in seeing essentially the torture that they went through and the abuse that they went through and how they experienced that in order to 
to end up being there for our entertainment. I realize that that's something that I couldn't morally agree with anymore as being a practice that we engaged in. Um, and I wonder if that's uh, maybe a useful thing to do if you are talking to, to students about the kind of norms that we have. We've seen, we're seeing a norm changing at the moment about how we think about plastics that suddenly we're seeing that we're actually using these things which will outlast us by hundreds of thousands of years once and then throwing them away. Like the, the, the plate that I had, I didn't actually eat a, use a disposable plate for lunch today, but hypothetically the plate, disposable plate I would use today would have more influence on the planet than I will ever have. And I use it once. And that's a big thing to realize that we should be shifting those norms. So I think maybe part of it is, um, identifying those things that we accept as given, pointing out that a lot of those norms are not normal, we've just adopted them, and leading to some kind of change with them. That's how I pestered my parents to start recycling, and that shifted kind of within the space of 10 years in Ireland, where everybody starts recycling. Similar thing happened here. Um, but part of it is just calling them out as, why do you do this behavior? Is that okay? What are the consequences? Because there's a lot of behavioral change that we need to make that are underlying the causes of climate change that we kind of have to start tackling our, the way we interact with the, the world. Sorry for... That's fine. Um, I'd like to go back to the, uh, the buffalo and the wolves and such. Uh, the success of those uh, programs are on, uh, let's say, segregated areas. Um, so uh, it's great that the buffalo uh, maybe are improving the prairie mm -hmm. and the wolves have improved the park, but how would those animals affect like the U.S. if we just let them uh, freely wander? I mean, you don't want to, you, could you collide with a buffalo? It's bad enough colliding with a deer on your vehicle. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, I mean, I, I don't know how much risk are we willing to put into our lives to allow that all to come back. I think this gets at Amir's point about uh, we have to make choices. I mean, um, we have to decide how much you know, territory we allow to the buffalo or the, or the wolves. Um, where is it that, that we're going to declare the limits and what we're willing to live with? So I, it's not a choice that I, I necessarily have in mind. I don't have a, an idea of where that ends or where it begins, but it definitely is a choice. So as a member of the Jackson Park Advisory Council, <laughs> I'd like to point out to those who do live in this community that we could have a major problem with bird migration patterns being disturbed if the Obama Presidential Center is built in Jackson Park. And is bird migration and bird changes in where that, I know the butterflies, for instance, that has changed dramatically between the U.S. and Mexico. Have bird patterns of migration been altered in recent years? Not, that's not something that I, that I particularly know too much about. Just on the Obama, so going back to the, the choice thing, so the, the half a billion dollar investment will be the largest investment in, in basically in the history of the South Side. This comes back to uh, another choice. So yes, there'll be impacts on the environment, there'll be impacts on other things, but it comes back to what we are willing to accept and, and not. You can place infinite value on the birds and then you don't do anything. Or you can place some kind of other value on the birds and then you start to look at the benefits and trade-offs. I don't think that, like, I don't have a, a particular view on that, but the wrestling with those choices, do you let the buffalo come back and how much this disrupts people's lives? That's exactly the discussion we need to be having. That's what discussion people are having in India right now, how much do they limit their emissions, knowing that people's lives will be saved by using more energy, but people might also lose their lives because climate change happens. So how do we resolve that trade-off? They're exactly the discussions that I think people need to have, and particularly people in like the current elementary school to teenager generation, whatever name you want to give to that, are, that's the world that they'll be facing, one where the trade-offs are much starker about everything, because we're kind of using up a lot of the remaining space left in the environment, and so equipping people to deal with those types of trade-offs, I think, is a, is, a, is a really useful thing to do. We have to be clear about the fact that there are multiple choices a lot of times instead of just instead of a couple of choices. I mean, we could have Jackson Park and we could have the investment of the Obama Center if, if it was in a different location. So and the Obama Center could go anywhere on empty property. It doesn't have to go in a park. Well, yeah, same. 
very bad effects of that center. And I thought it was still under some kind of review. Sorry. I thought it was some kind of review is still undergoing for that Obama Center. There are at sure. least three reviews going on. Yeah. One is a Section I mean, 106 review that has to do with the historical nature of, of the uh, area because it's a, in the National Register of Historic Places. There's uh, the NEPA review, which is an environmental assessment for now, but may eventually become an environmental impact statement. And I'm trying to remember what the and third one is. And we almost got a monstrosity on, along the lake shore with that Spielberg thing. I mean, thank mm -hmm. God they Lucas. put a stop to it. I mean, yeah. It was horrible. I mean, you know. I would just say, so Olmsted, when he planned uh, the park, had intended that area where the library is going to be as a sheep meadow with actual sheep roaming around. So it would be nice to go back to <laughs> Olmsted's original idea if we're talking about originalism of what that should be. Um, do you mind if I ask a question of, no, sure. of you? Sure. Why did Montreal work? And what lessons do we learn for climate change based on that? There are a couple of reasons, um, one of which was the commitment of, of countries throughout the world to do it. It's the first UN agreement that every nation signed on to. It got the support of, of people of all kinds of ideologies, but it also was the fact that uh, CFCs were going out of, I don't want to say out of style, but there were, there were alternatives already in place for um, replacing CFCs with, with things that were less uh, dangerous to, to the ozone layer. Um, in the same way that while the cost of alternative fuels is, is going down and going down dramatically, we're not at the place where we're going to do a one-to-one -one replacement just yet. So the resistance from the, um, from the uh, oil industry is, and their practical objections as well to being replaced um, are a little bit more meaningful than, than with the CFCs. And there are fewer players politically in this. Uh, there are only a couple of com companies that made CFCs, yeah. whereas the oil, oil industry is worldwide. And, you know, so there are a lot of reasons. But what are the lessons that you would learn from that? If it's not, if there's not a direct line between, there's no substitute technology, that kind of thing. What what do we learn from Montreal about the current crisis that, um, that helps? I think I think we learn that change can happen, but at the same time, I think we, given the differences in the in the cases, I think we have to look at it in terms of how, what can be done on a more local level. Yeah, I don't think that, I'm not sure that one international agreement is going to yeah. necessarily solve this issue. Um, and, and we've had a couple that have, have sort of, could have led us on that path and weren't implemented. So, you know, maybe it has to be a more local yeah. situation.